All right, hi everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Ron Schulman, and I'm the managing partner at Schulman Partners. I'm really excited to welcome you to our firm's Knowledge Share series. Webinars allowing us to learn and sharpen our skills. Today's topic, dealing with difficult people in the context of family law. I know it's very much, uh, I was looking forward to this topic. I'm sure we all encounter uh, people in our professional and daily lives who we think are difficult. Skills to deal with these situations are critical, especially in family law context, where emotions very often run very high. I'm even more excited to introduce you to our presenter today, Gary Darenfield. Let me tell you a few words about Gary. You may have seen Gary's articles on our website, or you've seen his insightful posts online in social media. Gary's expertise is quite extensive, and we are grateful for him to conduct this webinar uh, for us. Gary is a social worker at master's level and has been working with people for over 38 years. He has been deemed an expert in Ontario courts, in social work, marital and family therapy, custody and access recommendations, child development, as well as an expert at assessing the work of other experts. You may also know Gary as well as a known media personality. He is known publicly for his 65 episodes of Newlywed, Nearly Dead on Slice Network and for his some 650 columns as parenting and relationship and family columnist for the Hamilton Spectator. Beyond that, you may have heard Gary as a regular on TV and radio. He has been interviewed on the radio and TV over 600 times. In 2015, Gary gave up his lucrative assessment and arbitration practice to devote himself fully to counseling and peacemaking. With, no, with that, he no longer involves himself in court matters, preferring to help people settle their differences through processes such as collaborative law, mediation, counseling, and coaching. In addition to his private practice, Gary provides workshops and keynotes talks throughout Canada and the US, such as the one we have the privilege of hosting today. I'm very pleased to have Gary with us today to speak on dealing with difficult people in the context of family law. Without further delay, Gary Darnfield. <laughs> howdy, howdy. Hi, Ron. And hi, hi. to everyone else. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't know how well people know you. You have a very busy law practice in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and I have been writing for you for several years now, providing content uh, for your website, and I've always liked you. You're not a difficult person. <laughs> You're the antithesis of a difficult person, in my experience. Uh, you've always been warm and gracious. So for me, it's a pleasure uh, to present on your behalf through your firm, just to let you know. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> so hi, folks. Hi, everyone. Today we're going to be talking about dealing with difficult people in the context of family law. I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint and give me a sec because we are going to let that start. So as I understand it, you can see me at one side of your screen in a little box, and then you've got the uh, PowerPoint presentation beside you. Um, so I have to remember uh, that, that you can see me, because I can't see you, and I can't even see myself on this screen. I just see my PowerPoint. Gary, you're see, you need to share your PowerPoint. Oh, <laughs> all righty then. Uh, give me one second, and thank you for tell telling me that, Ron. Uh, Oh my goodness, uh, and so uh, there you go. The beauty of technology. Hit share. And uh, there we go. Now tell me you can see that because I can't see you. Maybe I can. OK. I think I've corrected for that. <coughs> Thank you. Oh, great. Good. 
Good, good, good. So yes, um, I can see Ron in the corner of my screen. He can wave to me and send me high signs uh, if, <laughs> if, if I get off track. So here we are dealing with difficult people in the context of family law. Um, I want to encourage you to uh, follow my Facebook page uh, or my LinkedIn page or both. The content that I provide, um, yeah, there's some crossover, uh, but there's also some differences appreciating that my Facebook page is mostly to help people in distress or to help people not necessarily not necessarily in distress, but those who might benefit from uh, some guidance. Uh, these days it's guidance on dealing with COVID and the impact on us socially and within our families. And on LinkedIn, it's business to business. So how to manage your practice uh, and how to present yourself and how to market. So slight differences, some over overlap. So uh, do look for me on LinkedIn uh, and uh, Facebook. <clears throat> you know, what is this difficult person? We certainly all know it when we come up against one. These are people that may upset easily, that won't listen, that are resistant, won't take responsibility. Here's the list. You've got your list. I've got my list together. You know, we can have this bigger list, but it's essentially a person uh, who who is difficult. Difficult. It also be can be a person who is very impulsive and excitable excitable and also a difficult person maybe not the one who's in your face with anger or hostility can also be a person who who dissembles that's a psychiatric term who falls apart easily um, emotionally oh everything you know so so that can be a difficult person to work with if they're always in that kind of uh histrionic, again, I'm using psychiatric terms and I don't know if I necessarily should, but I am for this moment, uh, that, that you know, upset everything's an issue. Uh, that can be a difficult person, uh, as can people who have difficulty making decisions. Uh, they don't know which way to go. That can feel like it puts an onus of responsibility on you, uh, which you may not want in your practice. So. Uh, there's a number of different traits that uh, comprise the difficult person. I'm just taking off my watch and setting it up so I can be mindful of the time. I've got about 140. I think we're going till about 230-ish. <clears throat> now, in terms of this uh, difficult person, sometimes we have to think about who is it. Uh, very often we think it's the other <laughs> the other person, quite frankly, it could be me, could be ourselves. We could be that difficult person. Uh, for you family law lawyers out there, for you coaches, therapists out there, it could be your client. Uh, it could be the other party uh, subject to the dispute that you're trying to help resolve. It could be a lawyer. You know, we, we, we come into our practice with our own personalities as well. And the other thing to remember in terms of who's that difficult person, it may not be the person sitting in front of you. Something to consider. It could be uh, extended kin, uh, a parent, a new partner, children's friends. That difficult person may be an influencer who's, who's a negative influencer or what we sometimes call a negative advocate who behind the scenes is, is bringing some challenges to the person you are trying to work with or the other party. So <clears throat> just, just to bear in mind that the difficult person you are grappling with may not be the one in front of you. It's just something to consider. So, when we look at this difficult person, whatever the, the difficulty is, we actually need to step back and understand what's underneath this person being difficult. What is, in a sense, energizing, juicing, creating uh, this person's difficulties? And in fact, I'm gonna talk about um, four areas with respect to what's contributing to the difficult 
disposition of the of the person that you're identifying is difficult. And in fact, the difficulty may be an artifact of the dispute resolution process. I'll get into that. It could be the lawyer. Um, it could be the family system. Uh, and of course, it could be the individual themselves. <clears throat> So with respect to uh, the legal process and lawyer disposition, there's ample research and anecdotal evidence uh, to demonstrate and, or, or suggest that the process we choose to resolve disputes may actually contribute to the very dispute. Think of litigation. For many people, litigation, unfortunately, can be a race to the bottom. I win to the degree to which I make you look bad. I've never met the person who wants to be made to look bad. So what do they do in return? Well, if you think you're going to make me look bad, now I'm going to make you look bad. And we're in this terrible, terrible race to the bottom, each making the other look poorly, uh, which creates distress, creates anger, creates hostility, creates resentment. Resentment often begets revenge. We have to discharge the resentment in order to make us feel better. Unfortunately, in discharging that resentment, seeking revenge, we continue to escalate matters. So it's important to look at this dispute resolution process. We differentiate that from collaborative family law or mediation, where we're not out to make anyone look bad. We're, we're trying to deal with things on a go forward basis. So rather than saying, as in litigation, I, I should have this outcome because this person's a scoundrel in that way, in mediation and collaborative law, we say, notwithstanding what has gone on and what we may have to address, how do we move forward? How do we repair things? How do we bring things about such that we can have a mutually um, agreeable and satisfying outcome? <clears throat> So it's a very different approach to the dispute resolution process, which in turn has a different impact impact on those very participants. So so we have to recognize that sometimes the disposition of the individual is an artifact of the dispute resolution process. The other thing we have to be um, mindful of is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the disposition of the lawyer. Um, some lawyers, they practice a very aggressive form of lawyering. Uh, they may say, see this as zealous advocacy, uh, but in fact, it's very aggressive. There was a file towards the end of uh, 2014, which was the last file I worked on as a custody and access assessor, or in the US, we refer to them as evaluators, or you refer them to them as evaluators. <clears throat> as part of my assessment process, it's written into my contract, or it was, that if I think I can help the parties come to an agreement along the way of the, of the process, I'm allowed to, in a sense, put the assessment process on hold and see if I can facilitate uh, a mutually acceptable outcome. <coughs> For me, the benefit of that is why continue in an assessment that's going to be used in a in a uh, contested matter when way before that as a result of what i i learned uh why not help them resolve matters so uh there was one such file i realized first of all the parties weren't very far apart and what they were asking for and they really had a misunderstanding uh on the basis of some cultural differences uh and with their permission, I invited them both to a meeting to discuss those very things. And we did. At the end of it, we set out a parenting plan where the difference between the two of them was two hours. Two hours over a 14 uh, day period, a two week period. And with that, I said, uh, go back to your lawyers. Uh, see what they have to say. And in all honesty, I fully expected the lawyers on both sides to say it's a two hour difference forget about it so that hopefully both come back and I'd have a happiness problem, which is both are agreeing to to accept and 
and let go of something and move on. However, I got a very nasty uh, lawyer's letter. And the lawyer's letter was, uh, how dare I meet with their client? How dare I uh, coerce their client into a settlement meeting? Uh, and it was, how dare I, how dare I, how dare I? And with that letter, I realized uh, it was a lawyer who I hadn't worked with before, and this was aggressive, very aggressive lawyering, um, uh, where I'm now going to be uh, targeted and scapegoated. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I managed that by uh, including that lawyer's letter in my uh, custody and access assessment evaluation and pointing to the conflict between the parties as lawyer generated conflict. So these parties, although they started out difficult, once we got underneath, saw what was going on, it wasn't an issue of the parties. So sometimes we have to look beyond those persons to say what is underneath that may be creating the conflict that they're presenting with. So again, it can be the actual legal process where we're pitting one against the other in litigation, or it can be aggressive lawyering um, uh, adding to that problem. <clears throat> then we look at the family system. OK, because let's say we've got reasonable lawyers, even if it is a litigation process, they're not they're not being mean spirited. They're not uh, looking to uh, denigrate the other the other person. But it still sometimes comes down to who's paying the bills. Um, we've all had many a cases where it isn't the client, it's the client's parents and they in turn may have um, uh, a view in terms of the outcome as grandparents of the children involved. So we want to know, <coughs> excuse me, who was calling the shots? Who was influencing uh, outside the courtroom? Many parents, uh, many persons in dispute, they turn to their friends as well as family members. And uh, if you've had a friend who's had a nasty divorce, and that's the source of the, the influence or the information, that too will be very biased. That too can create a difficult person in the person you are serving or the person on the other side. Um, we sometimes refer to the people on the outside, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as the Greek chorus. In ancient Greek plays, uh, particularly in the tragedies, there was a group of, uh, in a sense, performers who would sit at the edge of the stage and as a group provide commentary to the dramatic action. So here they are at the side looking on and throwing in their two cents, Say, like an armchair quarterback. Uh, many of us have done that, uh, being an, an armchair quarterback, throwing in the plays uh, from the outside, or at least throwing in, if not the actual plays, commentary that will influence the play. So when we're trying to understand this difficult person, we still have to determine what's underneath it. And when it's not the legal system or the lawyers, is there someone outside of this person? And, you know, to figure that out, it takes questions. Where do you get your information? Who's paying for this? Uh, who do you talk to about these things? Uh, um, the persons who you do talk to, how do they feel about this? Have they been through a separation or divorce themselves? What has that been like? So we want to understand who is influencing this person. <clears throat> when it comes time to managing the influencer. Um, there are a number of strategies available for doing so. And so uh, of those strategies, you can actually invite the influencer. Um, when I have an influencer, I'm trying to work with a couple and there's an influencer outside, I do like to invite the influencer. <clears throat> um, there's a saying, better the devil you know. So in inviting the influencer, 
you now know who you're grappling with. <clears throat> and then you, you can work with that person alongside the couple. That may take some creativity. It's going to take some um, uh, permissions. You may need to bring, bring balance to that meeting. If they're going to bring their influencer, can you bring your influencer? And so these are just ways that we have uh, larger discussions. So if you're in a collaborative law process, you're expanding the team through that by bringing in these influencers. If you are in a litigation process and you're dealing with your own client, you're going to deal with that client and their influencer. Uh, you're not necessarily going to work in terms of meetings and teams. <clears throat> Where possible, with respect to that Greek chorus, a group of folks um, adding in their two cents, sometimes we also think in terms of how can we fire that person? So how can we, we um, let go or help the person we're dealing with let go of that influence? And so, you know, those are questions are, okay, that's what that person thinks and feels, but what do you think and feel? So we ask questions that help the person in front of us differentiate between their thoughts and feelings versus the influencer or the Greek chorus. <clears throat> From a collaborative point of view and even a mediation point of view, when we're at an impasse and we feel like we've got a difficult person, the truth is sometimes we want to find an influencer. I remember years ago working in a large children's mental health center in the 1980s. This was Thistletown Regional Center. It was a great experience working at this uh, children's mental health center. We had an abysmal outcome with a uh, 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 black Canadian youth, uh, particularly those that came from the Caribbean. Cultural differences, we'd work with these youths and their families, and um, quite frankly, we weren't getting anywhere. The program director decided to hire a black uh, uh, psychologist from the Caribbean, which was a brilliant move. So this person came in, his name uh, was Delroy Loudon, really nice guy. And he taught us the concept of the Obia man. And I hope I'm saying this properly or correctly, so please forgive me if, if I'm mispronouncing. Delroy explained the Obia man <clears throat> as the tribal elder. This is the one who held influence over, over the tribe, over the group. And he said, when you bring in the obium man, then the obium man can, in a sense, do a laying of hands and say, you are to trust this helper. So Delroy would sit in on all of our first meetings if we're dealing with a, um, uh, a black uh, Caribbean family in, in the unit. And in his beautiful Jamaican accent, he would tell them, and I'm going to butcher this, and I, I don't... I, should I use my accent or not? Maybe I won't. But he'd say, listen, you have to listen to Mr. Derenfeld here. And if you, you don't listen, then you're going to have to deal with me. I got to tell you, this was not family therapy as I was trained. I would never, never behave that way, finger out and pointing to a family, telling them they got to listen to me. But from a cultural perspective, at least back then in the 1980s, it worked. It's like Delroy did a, a, a laying of hands to say, this guy's good and you have to listen to him. So I've taken what Delroy has, has given me and I've applied it over the years to my practice. So I, I in, in one uh, situation, I was having trouble getting uh, a young Jewish couple to deal with their grandparent who really needed psychiatric care. And they were reluctant to, to um, facilitate the psychi psychiatric care that their, that their aging parents, sorry, required. <clears throat> so I asked to speak with their rabbi, and I did. I met with the rabbi, explained what was going on for the aging parent and what would be helpful. 
And that rabbi then met with the couple. They, they were a religious couple, and that rabbi had considerable influence. And with that, the aging parent got the appropriate psychiatric care that was necessary. In other circumstances, I will say to a couple, who do you both agree to um, is influential in your life? Who do you both agree to that you respect and would listen to? I got news for you. It could be the dentist. It could be the accountant. It's frequently the accountant, by the way. And um, whoever it is, they say, and it, it could be a family friend. It could be an elder in their community. Let's invite that person in. Let's invite that person in. And it's really interesting because you get that person into the room and all of a sudden the behavior of one or both parties actually improves. So when we're looking again at here is this difficult person, where's the issue? Because it isn't always in the person themselves. We can deal with it from uh, a system, what we call a systemic perspective. The other thing that you can do, because sometimes it really is the person, <clears throat> uh, you can bring in a facilitator if you're working in teams uh, or in, uh, um, yeah, if you're working in a collaborative approach. The other thing that you can do is uh, consider a divorce coach uh, specifically, a divorce coach. I might have misspoke a moment ago. I'll see when I read, uh, when I review the tape, my apologies. But another thing to consider is a divorce coach. The role of the divorce coach is not to advise on legal matters. The role of the divorce coach is to help that person manage themselves more constructively in whatever divorce process you're using whether it's litigation, collaborative law, mediation, counseling. <clears throat> so, so that person, the divorce coach, um, sorry, will help that client, the individual, to manage themselves, to learn what their triggers are, to learn how to respond in a way that will hopefully be more helpful to the situation. I've been called in as a divorce coach on so many files, and it's really interesting. Sometimes I'm the divorce coach on a file where uh, it's in litigation and someone has quite a conflictual personality and they're hoping that I can help that person to manage themselves better, uh, which typically we are able to. No promise, you can't help everyone. Uh, and sometimes it's the person on the other side who's being overrun, overwhelmed with the person uh, who, with a difficult uh, disposition. So how can I help that person to manage in this context? And again, that can be in litigation, collaborative family law, litigation, uh, counseling. So the role of the, of the, the divorce coach can re be remarkably uh, settling, if you will, for a person with a difficult personality. Okay. Now let's bring it down to the level of the individual. Probably one of the best uh, writers and minds when it comes to working with difficult people specifically is uh, Mr. Bill Eddy. Bill is a former social worker, come family law lawyer, and he put together the thinking of uh, both professions. <clears throat> Being a social worker, he realized that technically he's not allowed to uh, diagnose. Uh, so he can't say, you've got a personality disorder and it is this type. So rather than talking about personality disorders, he came up with his own lingo. And the lingo is a high conflict personality. And according to Bill, there are four features of the high conflict personality. I'm just minding myself of the time. And here they are up on uh, the PowerPoint. So those four features, all or none thinking. Uh, we sometimes refer to that as black and white thinking. We refer to it as binary thinking. 
at the end of the day, it's you're either for me or against me. This all or none thinking. This is either the greatest solution or the worst solution. All or none thinking. And when you have somebody who thinks in those terms, <clears throat> they either want the whole pie or they see that they're getting the whole pie or they're not getting enough of the pie and it's unfair. Uh, they, they often look at things in terms of fair and unfair. They look at things in terms of <clears throat> equal or uneven. And, and so for them, uh, everything has to be, you know, I call them even Stevens. The other uh, uh, feature of the high conflict personality, according to Bill, is unmanaged emotions. So, so they can go from cold to hot, zero to 60, you know, in a heartbeat. These unmanaged emotions and they're, ex they're extreme. They just flow out of them. I have a feeling it leads right to behavior. And according to Bill, that's often as a result, extreme behavior. I, I can yell, I can shout, I can, I can sit there with such an intensity. Okay, so all in unthinking, unmanaged emotions, extreme behavior. And then he says the fourth feature of this high conflict personality is they're always looking for somebody else to blame, a target of blame. And so taken together, this is what, what Bill refers to as the, the high conflict personality. These are very difficult persons to work with. Underneath it, Bill does talk about, as do I, uh, personality disorders. And so there are certain personality disorders that, that can give rise to this high conflict personality. Um, of those, we typically talk about a narcissistic personality disorder and a borderline personality disorder. In the narcissistic personality disorder, it's all about me. And if it ain't about me, I'm hard done by. And that part of the all or none thinking. And, and I'm better and I'm smarter and I know more than you. Uh, funny enough, somewhere here, somebody had written in a question for today. Lord knows I've misplaced it. There it is, and it says, you know, what do you have? What do you do when you have a client who's always right? Uh, they're never wrong, and they want you to follow a course of action uh, in managing their case where you know it isn't appropriate, but they're always right. Uh, what do you do with these folks? We'll get back to that. So having this uh, all or none thinking, unmanaged emotions, target blame, etc. What do you do? What do you do? And these are people who seem to be highly tuned to what's going on with the other, but through a lens that says, I think you're going to be out to get me. I think that you're not thinking in terms of what's favorable to me. So I'm always going to be looking uh, through that lens. So that, that creates in them an excitability. <clears throat> so knowing all of that, what would we do? Particularly when these folks who are not only difficult, but excitable, and, and they can be intimidating, they can be overwhelming, and they can create distress and anxiety in us, the service provider, whether you're a family law lawyer, whether a counselor, mediator, mediator et cetera. So what do we do? The first thing we do is we find our calm. In the midst of that storm, in the midst of the barrage, we find our calm. There was research done in the 1990s, a group of, I believe it was psychologists, they had some macaque monkeys and they wired some electrodes to these monkeys' brains. And what they did was uh, for it, this happened first by accident, not by design. So we have these two monkeys side by side. They're both wired up to uh, electroencephalograms so that we can read their, their brain um, signals. And we show 
a banana and give a banana to one monkey. And we fully expect that the brain area of this monkey is going to go wee woo woo woo. You know, it, it's <laughs> wee 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 woo. That's a technical term. Uh, but it's going to light up because this monkey is eating the banana. Well, really, really interesting. This monkey who isn't eating a banana, the same brain areas start lighting up. You know the phrase monkey see? monkey do? It's true. And, and there's a neural substrate that, that, uh, that supports this monkey see, monkey do. They came to call this neural substrate mirror neurons because the, the neurons here mirror what's going on in the neurons here where this monkey has the bona fide stimuli but this monkey only gets to look. Wow. Decade later, <clears throat> not sure if it was the same or a different group of researchers, but they take those electrodes and they hook them up to humans. It's not intrusive, not going to kill anyone. <clears throat> and what they found was same thing, that we as humans have these mirror neurons. So if this person experiences a threat or is eating something or is having an emotional response because there's something that's truly going on in their life environment in the moment, this person who isn't witness to what is going on out there but sees the response of the individual, their mirror neurons fire and it's there's an as if they are experiencing the same as that individual monkey see monkey do we do it too <clears throat> so with respect to dealing with difficult people how does this all apply you've got this person going on a tear we look at them we're not provoked by the by the stimulus of what created their tear uh, however we are provoked by their response. What we see in them excites the same in us. Wow, and that's why we begin to feel anxious, why we begin to escalate. <clears throat> now think about the interplay. As I'm escalating, I'm now triggering this person's mirror neurons. Well, you've seen it play out in real life. I think you are, no, you are, no, you are, no, yeah, right? And we see this uh, remarkable escalation of conflict. And it can happen so quickly. And in particular, for couples who have been with each other for months, years, it almost short circuits to that um, mirror neuron quick response. And boom, they're both ignited. But we're not monkeys. Or mammals apparently of a higher order. We have the capacity of self-reflection. We have the capacity of self-control. It's really interesting. So with that, I can learn what my triggers are. That when somebody gets excited, my shoulders go up to my ears. My breathing comes up to my chest. I start to feel butterflies in my belly. So I recognize the signs in myself. With that, I now have choices. I can literally say, I don't want to feel that way. I can literally um, uh, use my mind and lower my shoulders. I can deliberately take a deep breath, a diaphragmatic breath, a breath that comes down to my belly. And with that, I calm myself. So rather than now being prey from a neuron, mirror neuron perspective to only being able to respond in kind, monkey see, monkey do, I now have the element of choice. Wow. So it's really important in our work to learn how to calm ourselves. That's what mindfulness is all about. Mindfulness, it's just the ability to self-reflect, see where we are, make a different choice. 
fastest definition of mindfulness you may ever hear. So with that, as I con myself, I am, I am literally intentionally thinking about triggering this difficult person's mirror neurons. They're getting excited, I get less excited. I'm going to go, why aren't you getting excited? I don't know. You know, I, I, I hear that you're excited. It makes it very difficult to stay in a heightened emotional state yourself when you're with someone whose emotional state doesn't reflect your own and where their emotional state not only doesn't not reflect your own, it's the antithesis, it's the opposite of your own. And this is how we bring people down. This is how we calm them. So I can't, I'm not gonna do a personality ectomy. I'm not gonna change your personality, but I'm gonna manage me in a way that can provide a better influence towards you. So this is about bringing our calm. Some people want to bring a knife to a, a gunfight or another gun to a gunfight. I only ever want to bring my calm. Think about that. <clears throat> so it's all about managing the connection. And I talk about empathy over anger, empathy over power and control, empathy over admonishment or blame or shame, empathy over reward or consequences. So the degree to which I can say, wow, um, I get it. This, this is really something for you. The person feels heard. The person feels respected. The person feels are calm. They're typically able to better manage and control their own emotions and behavior. <clears throat> in in um, child behavior literature and research, there's actually a name for that. It's called co-regulation, co-regulation. I'm gonna help you regulate your behavior by me regulating mine. Bill Eddy, um, I'm gonna to refer to a couple of his works. One is called uh, Ear Statements. If you Google uh, Bill Eddy, E-D-D-Y, and Ear, E-A-R Statements, you'll come to a page on his website. <clears throat> And it's um, consistent with what I have just been talking about. Uh, an ear statement is about listening respectfully without agreeing. And I got to tell you, you work with some high conflict folks and even their partners, they don't want to listen respectfully. I'm too resentful. And so we have to explain that using these tools is not about agreeing with the other person. It's about managing us to minimize the risk of that person going off half cocked. When we manage us, when they don't go off half cocked, we're going to have a better conversation. They will be more conducive to uh, settling things. So an ear statement, uh, Bill likes his acronyms. Uh, ear stands for empathy, attention, and respect. And, and it it's, it's a fascinating tool. You can sit in front of somebody who's losing it, and once your mindfulness kicks in and you realize, uh-oh, this person is losing it, they've been triggered, they're gonna go into a heightened emotional state, we're gonna see extreme behavior, extreme emotions, they're gonna go into black and white thinking on a greater level. How do we settle them down? Ear statements, empathy and attention. I can hear how upset you are. Uh, tell me what's going on. Um, I really want to hear from you. That's attention. And I really respect what you have to say. And I personally will use the word respect in my communication because very often the high conflict personality, they don't feel respected at their core. So to be explicit about that helps people to, to calm themselves when we use uh, ear statements practice that the next time. Just try this stuff out. See see how it works for you. You may have a hard time remembering your statements. Uh, write it down on a piece of paper. Ear, E-A-R. Tack it up against a wall. And so when you're working with someone, it's there as a constant reminder. And if this person seems to be getting um, emotionally excited, think of, I can hear how upset you are. 
tell me what's going on. I really want to listen to you. I respect what you have to say. Now, you don't need to use those sentences specifically, but to give an em empathic response, demonstrate I'm listening to you just by virtue of making eye contact, body language, it's open, you're, you're drawing yourself forward, and, and to say, um, uh, I'm really interested. That is a respectful comment. <clears throat> the other uh, thing that Bill gives us, I'm going to talk about two of his books. We've got 10 minutes left. Uh, the first book I'm going to talk about is called BIF. Uh, and again, Bill and his acronyms, Brief and Formative, Friendly and Firm. Uh, many folks who have that high conflict disposition, wow, you will receive diatribes from them. Uh, emails, text messages, voicemails, and they're like one huge run on sentence. And they're not just talking about the issue of the moment. They're telling you how you're responsible for it, how none of this wouldn't happen if it weren't for you, and the horse you rode in on, and maybe, maybe one of your parents uh, was at fault as well. There's enough blame to go go around. So they, they talk often in diatribes, particularly when they are agitated. So BIF is all about responding to the diatribe in a way that minimizes the risk of inflaming it. And the first thing you got to know about BIF and responding is uh, ask yourself the first question. Does this require a response? Because some things don't. Some things are merely venting. And so, we, you know, it could be, thank you, I've received it. It doesn't bear a response. But if it does, then how do we respond to a diatribe? We do not respond in kind. Remember those mirror neurons. It's very important. We're going to respond briefly, informative, friendly, and firm. So I received your, your text. You certainly go over many things. Uh, and while, I'm, uh, while I see that they are very important to you, the real issue in the moment is whether or not um, uh, the access exchange is going to happen at this place or that place. Um, it's been suggested it be this place. Let me know. I got to know by Friday to let the other side uh, know. If we don't let the other no side know by Friday, um, they're likely going to go ahead with this instead. Very informative, friendly, and firm. I don't need to respond to the rest of it. It's, in a sense, noise. Noise. Uh, there are those persons who feel they have to respond to everything. Well, what if it's used against you? And, you know, a very legalistic perspective. Those folks often find that when you respond to everything, then you get another counter response to everything that you had to mention. So it, it tends to escalate. And I look at it from that perspective of mirror neurons, and it makes total sense. So brief, informative, friendly, and firm. The other thing that Bill teaches us with these high conflict uh, types, high conflict personalities, is that they get caught up in the why of what's going on and not the what, when, where, or how. So particularly in mediation, uh, most mediators were trained and collaborative law practitioners were trained in what's called interest-based negotiation. Help me to understand what's underneath uh, what you're seeking. Uh, and that is a why question. <clears throat> well, with these high conflict personality types, they're busy assessing and judging your why. So they never get from the why to the how, what, where, when, and and, and how, what, where, and when, forget the why. So when I'm working with these folks, and as per this book, so what's your proposal? We don't care what the why is. Uh, I'd like to be able to pick up the kids uh, Friday at five o'clock. Uh, would that work for you? That's my proposal, picking up the kids Friday at five. If we get into the why, I might hear from the other side, well, I want it at five because you're so unreliable that I don't want you picking up the kids from school because if I think you're going to pick them up from school, you're always late. Well, here's my one. Wow, there's a setup for conflict. So let's leave that. Let's just leave it off the table. Let's leave the what. The what is uh, I'd like to pick up the kids at five o'clock. And according to Bill and this book, 
you have one of several responses. One is, I agree, five o'clock works. We don't need to know the whys. That's a good response. The other is you can ask for clarification. So when you say five o'clock, uh, is that from your house or, or are you gonna deliver to my house? Is it at a neutral location? Let's just flesh out some of the what and how it's going to transpire without getting into the whys. Uh, and with that and fleshing that out, we may come to a yes, that's good. Another response, according to Bill, is um, let me think about that, which quite frankly is totally reasonable. Uh, depending on what's being discussed, we may need to get back with a new partner who's got their own kids they're juggling, or we may need to consider who's available to child mind when we're looking at doing it. There could be so many different reasons why I have to get back to. But if we are going to get back to somebody, it we we have to provide some parameters for that. I will get back to you in three days time with you know with my response to your proposal. And and of course, the last response is no, I don't accept your proposal. From a mediation perspective, Bill suggests or a collaborative law perspective, Bill suggests that if the answer is no, the person who says no, it's up to them to make a counter proposal. If it always is the same person proposing, they can be like throwing darts at a wall and they don't know where the target is. And so that's not fair. Uh, so this is just another book uh, that I would suggest for folks because you can take that into all of this, you can take into the litigation arena. We all know that before you reach that trial, you're gonna have a settlement conference. How are you gonna manage yourself? How is your client going to, to manage their own deportment? How are both of you gonna manage being triggered? How are you gonna manage your own triggers? Okay, so all of this, despite your dispute resolution process, is valuable stuff. The other thing to think about when we're looking at settlement, <clears throat> very often, uh, particularly in litigation, the mindset is us against them. It's a setup for conflict. Uh, and it's built into uh, typical family law training. We represent our client, that's it, and the interests of our client. The thing is, you're working in a family system. And so the family is never the individual. The family is all the members of that family. So if we change our mindset from us against them to we, and think of how do we drive outcomes uh, that are agreeable to everyone, whether that, again, whether that's in a litigation, excuse me, context, collaborative law or mediation or counseling or whatever process you're going to use. If we think more in terms of we, um, does what I am proposing, does what I am seeking, seeking uh, does that work for everyone? And so it, it's sometimes that shift in mindset. You're working with a difficult person. I want what I want. And then you have to have that discussion with them. If you get truly what you want and the other side does not, what is the other side? What is the likelihood of them following through meaningfully with whatever is agreed to or ordered? So, the, so when we can help our clients to understand that we all want durable outcomes, we don't want to be running back to court or back to the mediator. We want outcomes that are long lasting those outcomes are typically better achieved when we have a we mindset. This again is to help to dispel the, the energy of the difficult person. So in summary, folks determine what may be negatively influencing a person, causing them to be difficult. It's not necessarily what you see in front of you. And then you have to intervene on the matters of influence. It could be the process, the disposition of the lawyer, the family system, or that individual. Those of you who are in a litigation process, you you know you may not realize you can have a parallel process in mediation and collaborative law. They're not exclusive processes, so you can run in one and still be preparing and going down a different path at the same time by being in a mediation process, concurrent to even the litigation process, you may wind up resolving some things. That helps 
that helps lower the temperature. That helps make a difficult person less difficult. Uh, we have to examine our own disposition, disposition and our way of doing things. I, my approach to counseling, it's so different than my colleagues. The typical counseling hour is 45 to 50 minutes week after week. I surveyed clients for years and, and asked them, you know, how do they feel about that? What, what, what would work better for them from a counseling perspective? And invariably, one of the biggest complaints is that 45 to 50 minute session. They say, we just get cooking and, and now we're ready to get somewhere and the plug is pulled. I got to come back next week. When I come back next week, we spend five minutes. How are you? Ten minutes. What did we do last week? So now we're down to, to a half hour. Again, we barely get going. Do we remember what happened last week? Anyways, they don't like it. So I said, you know, what would be helpful? They said longer sessions. So in terms of my approach to counseling, every time, every time I set an appointment, it's a three hour uh, chunk of time set aside. I bill for actual time used. No one in counseling does this. I did it because it meets the needs of the clients. Now I've had people say to me, if you do that, you're losing a lot of billable time. I personally don't lose a lot of billable time. And you know, if there is excess time, I've got reports to write. I've got things to do. I've got my marketing to take care of. I'll go walk the dog. So by, by examining me and my process, it influences my service delivery. So, so you know, lawyer disposition, it's helpful to self reflect and take a look at who you are, what triggers you and how you manage you. Uh, with respect to the family system, we really do want to understand who is behind the scenes, who may be influencing or pulling strings. And as regards the individual, the work of Bill Eddy, uh, very instructive. So uh, the question was that was sent to me. I only received one question. Uh, what do you do when this person is always right? Uh, there are some, you know, this is the um, what I call the impossible question. When somebody poses a situation that is so impossible, there's no way out of it. Well, first of all, I would try everything that I talked about in this meeting. I would be wondering about other influences or influencers that you can bring into the process. Okay, I'd wonder what am I bringing to this situation? At the end of the day, you can do all of these things and still have a poor outcome. Just know that there is no single solution that 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 makes all difficult people wonderful and compliant. So you may have that person wanting you to run the file in there uh, as per their request, and you may re require a note on file um, that uh, that this person is doing so against legal opinion to protect yourself. OK, so we 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 don't cure. We don't solve every problem. It's all about how do we manage it differently in the hopes uh, of a better outcome. So this was dealing with difficult people in the context of family law. Truth is, you can use all of these strategies uh, anywhere in life. You can use them with an employee, with an employer, with your partner, with your child. That bringing your calm, that's one of my favorites personally. Uh, I'm always always thinking about what is my disposition in the moment? What, a, what is my body? What is my disposition reflecting back? And I want to be perceived as empathetic, listening, and calm. The degree to which we do that, we've managed uh, most of the difficult people that we may meet. So uh, Ron, I hope this was of value to uh, the members of your legal team. And to everyone else who's had an opportunity to listen, uh, I'm Gary Derenfeld. I'm a social worker. My website is YourSocialWorker.com for clinical services. And actually, I've got another one, GaryDarenfeld.com for marketing of clinical and legal services. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, very much. It has been very uh, insightful. Uh, lots of great comments and uh, wise ideas to try to implement. Uh, 
So thank you very much. Uh, I also want to thank everybody for attending and uh, a lot of food for thought of uh, putting it together and uh, trying it out. So it was very helpful and uh, thank you for the insights. Yeah, I think you're muted. Thank you, Ron, and to everyone out there. Uh, thank you for attending and watching. Go out there and bring your calm. Thank you, Gary, very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.